Sold six. Action. Hey. Welcome to Wine and Wine, where a few ladies get together and do a lot of talking and a little bit of drinking. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, ladies. Thank you. Thank you for us. Yeah. And today we have two special co-hosts. We have Jennifer Weiss Wolf and Laura Straussfeld, founders of Period Equity. Welcome. Thank you. Nice Ooh. to have you. Now, have any of y'all seen this Amber Rose commercial where she's seductively playing with a diamond necklace, which surprisingly turns out to be a tiny tampon? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So it talks about the government taxing these products. And what's so hilarious is where she tells them where to stick it. Yes, I love it. <laughs> yes. And they were a part of creating a lot that of that Amber so Rose content. Yeah. Telling the government where to stick that tag. Hey, <laughs> I'm not going to ask where. Yeah. Mm. yeah. You can guess where. We all know. <laughs> so today what we really want to talk about in a, in a broader sense is this pink tax. And for those people who don't really understand what the pink tax is about the fact that a lot of products that are uh, marketed towards women or made for women generally have a tax that or cost more than products that men use. So did any of y'all know that people, uh, well, we know you all yeah, know, yeah. you're from the movie, so I'm gonna talk right here for a second. Did either of you know that women were being, um, t about this pink tax and we're being charged for more for uh, things like clothing and items as opposed to males? You know, for me, and this is so sad to say and I hate to even admit it, I'm just so used to kind of I don't know, be, being taken advantage of in some way that I was kind of blind to it. It's the norm for me. So I never thought about, you know, why, you know, my toilet paper not being taxed, but perhaps my tampons are, or, you know, male products versus female products. Um, so I was pretty taken aback by, you know, the pink tax. Yeah, me too. And it's the kind of thing I didn't know that it existed for most of my life, fairly recently, maybe a few years ago. And I went to the drugstore because I was trying to see if it was real and picked up a pink razor and compared it with a men's razor. And really, it was more expensive. And it kind of just shocked me. Like, with everything that women have to go through, really, we're going to have to spend more money on our okay. products, too? What's All my life, I has to fight. <laughs> <laughs> and now I got to fight to have price equity. There's no wage equity. And then... You know, price equity there right, too. Exactly. Yeah. So why do you focus on taxes on feminine hygiene products? Two reasons the tax question came up first as a legislative agenda. One, because it's just so patently unfair. Mm. We said before we're whining about it, but we're not whining about it. We're taking right. action. Um, and tax law is not that complicated. Um, it was a little tricky because you have to go state by state. States are responsible right. for levying sales tax. But really, actually, I think the bigger goal is to make sure both that menstruation is destigmatized de and that our government is part of that, that process. We can all relate to being a 12-year-old girl in middle school and you suddenly get your period, especially like in our era, we didn't have apps to tell us when it was coming. And <laughs> you're like, what do I do now? And you grab a lot of toilet paper. I'm being totally visual here. Yeah. And you have to figure it out the hard way. Men don't have to relate to that. So is it something that they're just not, they don't relate to it so they don't think about it and they're totally willing to do it once we open our mouths or are we fighting this is is this an uphill battle for women to who to access tax I don't know. that's like that's such a good question you know president yeah. obama was asked about this in 2016 and his answer was so right on the money when he said it's because women aren't at the decision making table mm -hmm. so it's i i don't actually think it was a nefarious exclusion right. like some you know evil diabolical to, right, right? Mm -hmm. but nobody ever thought about it nobody ever asked and we didn't even have a climate where it felt safe or cool to ask 
Um, but that's changed. That's changed so much in the past couple of years. And even now, I think, in this new era of Me Too and Time's Up, and really, it's okay to be angry right now about being a woman in America. Um, there, it's, it's an uphill battle because there's a long way to go. But there's a really, really receptive audience to it in our state legislatures. Um, here in New York City, where we're all, I think, happily from, mm -hmm. um, New York City passed the first laws in the world that actually made it so that tampons and pads would be free in all the public school bathrooms, in all the shelters, and all the correction facilities. Um, but we're seeing lots of governments get on this bandwagon. Wow, that's amazing. That I know so now. Amazing. I take a few everywhere I go, just like for reparations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I paid, paid far too much for these for a while. Every time I stop in some place and they're free, I'm like, oh, thank you for this blessing. <laughs> Yes. You know, NPR called 2015 the year of the period. Okay. Um, and all of the activism that Laura and I have been involved with in creating this organization, Period Equity, um, is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nationwide movement right yeah. now. I'm, listen, I'm probably the senior of this group. And so back in my day, <laughs> they used to have the, the, the pads in a brown paper bag. Like yeah. it was really like a secret. Like you went right. there. Like, I mean, it's all about You need theory. that special package. They Going have cold words. the Amber Rose campaign, she's being seductive and luring you in to send a message. So in a way, it's still very secretive. We're still trying to like lure people in with this message because we can't just put it out there on the table. Period. I you don't know? know about that. Well, I mean, so many of the young people, I look at my daughter and them, they're like, oh, girl, I got my period. Like, I would have never said that. Honey, <laughs> really? And y'all got my friend. It's yeah. that time of the month. Right. Auntie Flo is here. Like, we have more little, little, little metaphors and cold There's words. There's 5,000 of them around the world. Yeah. Which What's one? The Auntie, the Auntie Flo? I don't know, actually, which one is the most used. Well, this uh, is most it, outrageous. Yeah, well, some of the My cool ones. My favorite is Carrie at the prom. Just because I love that movie. Hilarious. Plug it up. Plug like it shot. up. Plug it up. And that's what it was like, too. You got your period. It was almost like people were, like, ostracizing yeah. you. Nah. I think that if men had periods, tampons would be subsidized by the government already. Like, it would not even be a question. It would be... There would be, it would be, access would be everywhere, you know? The, if you think about the way we deal with erectile dysfunction, like how, mm. m how many studies there are about that, I think PubMed has like thousands of studies about that. Think but about the commercials. About, They're everywhere. Yeah, every day, everywhere yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah, commercials don't even show red blood. No, it's blue they liquid, show blue liquid. It's, you know. I like that you're focusing on whining about it. Like we can whine about the pink tax and, um, you know, dealing, aside from having to deal with this every month, we've got to pay extra for it. <laughs> but I do think what's happening now is we're, we're sort of shifting the burden to men who I think have finally realized that a period means that, and I'm going to be graphic here, women are just bleeding. And if you don't have stuff to deal with that, they could bleed in public places. You know, they could bleed on the subway seats. Like it's, it's sort of being in their face about the fact that this could be a really kind of unhygienic situation, unpleasant for them, give them something to whine about. So <laughs> that's why I feel like we're seeing a lot of um, men, you know, facing the reality and uh, maybe, you know, taking it on themselves to do something about it. But it's, it's all rooted in that. It's all rooted in some sort of dislike, distrust of women. And well, we're uprooting bodies. all of that today. Yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. Well, a little we're further. Thinking, You've been yeah. uprooting it, but we're going to uproot it a little more. <laughs> and we look forward to hearing more about your organization and your movement in the business spotlight that we're going to do, that you're going to do with Jackie. The founders of PeriodEquity.org are on a mission to ask the tax on feminine hygiene products. Laura Jen, we just talked about your campaign um, and what it's doing and what it's done, especially like in New York State and other states, to get rid of the tax on feminine hygiene products like pads and shampoos and things like that. Now, how can women take action? Well, one thing we've done is we've put up a petition. It's co-sponsored by Cosmopolitan Magazine, and it calls upon all of the states that still tax menstrual products to ax that tax. So they should sign the petition. It's on change.org. It's called Stop Taxing My Period, period. And um, a, another thing that people can do is read this book that Jennifer wrote, Periods Gone Public, which 
really is a great story of the work that Jennifer has done, the work we've done, and also what we plan to do moving forward. You ladies are definitely putting an exclamation mark on the period movement, so I personally thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us here. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Thank you. Pinotage Road Trip. This is a Vintel's wine from South Africa. This wine is very playful, it's very fun. It's got notes of vanilla, coconut, plum, raspberry. This would be a great wine to have as an addition to a barbecue. It would pair very well with spicy food, for example, a curry. So if you've got a family reunion coming up or some type of event and you've been looking for the right wine, you can head to Bronx Spirit or Bronx Cheers and pick up a bottle of this. The address will be below. Enjoy. Welcome back to Wine and Wine. We're going to continue our conversation on the pink tax and more specifically around feminine hygiene products with our two guest co-hosts for the day. So Jennifer, tell me, what compelled you to start this movement? Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to start this. It was about three and a half years ago. It was actually New Year's Day 2015. And as I was um, posting pictures actually on Facebook, I came across this um, post that these two kids in my community were uh, seeking tampon and pad donations for our local food pantry. And um, I was kind of shocked. It never occurred to me that here at home, mm -hmm. lack of access to menstrual products could be something that was holding people back, especially right. people who are most vulnerable because they are you know, young or low income. Um, or possibly even in, you know, in using the shelter system, right. or perhaps incarcerated. This was all the stuff kind of that occurred to me when I saw that first, that flyer for the first time. And then the more I started researching, the more I found out it really was this untapped, undiscussed potential issue here in yeah. this country. And Laura, how'd you get involved? Years ago, when I was a law student, I and living in New York, I noticed that we were being taxed on tampons. I bought tampons and chapstick, hmm. and chapstick There's wasn't taxed. <laughs> well, yeah, chapstick wasn't taxed because it had a medical use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So said the tax code. <laughs> so, yeah, so that made no sense. I went, looked up the law, and really for about um, 20 years, I tried to file a class action lawsuit to sue New York State for taxing tampons unlawfully. Mm. And um, no one cared, and, and people like people who knew me knew it was a th it was a thing that really bothered me. But no one cared. And then um, a few years ago, I, people started sending me articles. They knew I was interested in this, and they were authored by Jennifer Weiss Wolf. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, oh, people are beginning to care about this. And I had this lawsuit in my drawer, ready just to go, waiting. just waiting for the <laughs> right decades. time. And I, I called her up, and she was a little bit like, who are you? Uh, but I said, I, I have this lawsuit, I'm dying to file it, will it help? Because I wanted to work with her, and I, I've learned so much from her about the, um, the use of the press, you know, that you, to, to create a movement, and she mm -hmm. can talk even better about this, that, you know, if you have these different levers you can pull, then you can really affect change. Mm -hmm. So we um, got that case filed together. Wow. And then um, filed it against New York. Within 10 days, the legislature voted unanimously to eliminate the tax. And then in a couple more months, with the governor's signature, we finally, finally, after so long, um, I got to go to the drugstore and buy my chapstick and my tampons oh, and be so like, tax free. That was cool. I have the receipt. <laughs> like, so, you know, there's a funny piece of that because when it was September 1st, 2016, that the New York law went into effect. And I had this hunch that nobody was actually paying attention. Yeah. And so I asked Laura and a bunch of friends to go buy a box of tampons and see if they were taxed. And lo and behold, lots of people yeah, were taxed. I, I still I, have yeah. your tax at your, your receipt and you first, circled the first it with one. red and wrote what the fuck on it. <laughs> I to see yeah. that. So I got the media involved and we made a little campaign called hashtag tweet the receipt. And we all started tweeting our receipts at Governor Cuomo and New York Magazine reported on it and Cosmopolitan Magazine reported on it. And by yeah. the end of the day on September 1st, the, go the governor had set up a hotline for people to, to call if they'd been improperly taxed on these products. 
and Dwayne Reed and, C and CVS and all the stores we tweeted at wrote formal apologies that they were changing okay. the cash register system. Everyone basically just hadn't paid attention. Wow. So um, the I power of social attention. media, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good, good, good hashtag. Congratulations to you, good. the power yeah. of your voices, and that's yeah. all you had to use. Well, plus, um, you know, a lot of muscle work and like work But you used your voices to say, hey, this is a problem, and people addressed it. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Wine and Wine. We look forward to hearing from you. So if you have a topic you'd like us to talk about, just write it in the comment section and we'll make sure to try to whine about it soon. And if we do, we'll give you a shout out. So join us every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. We look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Bye. Cheers. Hey, cheers. This look like blood a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Next week on Wine and Wine, we're talking embracing your beauty with Kiara Kelly, staff writer at Hello Beautiful. How influential do you think that movies and television shows are in how people, uh, what they think is acceptable in terms of beauty? It's honestly gotten to the point where even me, who I feel like as a woman, I'm always talking about natural beauty. Sometimes you forget what women look like when they have not an ounce of makeup on. Like you forget that we all pretty much have like dark circles around our eyes and certain things. And I think everyone's touching up everything all the time that sometimes it's like when you look in the mirror, finally at your bare face, it's like, oh, sh sh can I cuss? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get, you get